So last week, I kind of teased this out a little bit with the Antichrist because we're in chapter 13. And there's a couple of different a couple of different things going on in this chapter. One are the personalities, and the other thing is uh, some of the nations and um, countries, so forth, kingdoms that are behind all of what's going on at this point in, in time. So I, I'm going to kind of break this up. I don't know how far we're going to get tonight, but that's fine. But we had a lot of Q&A last week, and that was awesome because you know, we got to kind of um, get caught up a little bit, get up to speed, and see where we've left off, and how everything lines up with where we are, keeping off the great uh, tribulation. So this brings us with the beast and the false trinity. So I don't know if the moniker false trinity is accurate, though it could be, and it may be Satan's motivation, but popularly um, people will refer to uh, the, the people who are involved here, I say people, the personalities who are involved here as a false trinity, and they'll say Satan, who desires to be like God, that's been his desire from the from the, his very beginning. We have the false Christ, the Antichrist, the pseudo-Christ, wants to be like Christ. And then some people will say, well, the false prophet is kind of like the Holy Spirit. In the way the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit does not point to himself, doesn't glorify himself. He's always the Holy Spirit's always pointing to Christ. So that's what the false prophet does. Could be um, some people say, well no, the role of well, a false prophet might be more akin to John the Baptist. So, in in uh, this commentary, Revelation commentary by John MacArthur, he's got this paragraph in here that I'll just read to you real quick. There's some references in there that you're familiar with from First John. But he says, um, Just as the Antichrist will be the culmination of a long line of political rulers, so also will he be the ultimate false religious leader. In the broadest sense, an Antichrist is any who denies the Father and the Son. That's 1 John 2.22. Because one does not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh, is the deceiver and the Antichrist, 2 John 2.7. Such charlatans have been around throughout human history. In the first century, the Apostle John lamented that, quote, even now many Antichrists have appeared, close quote, It's also First John 4, 3. But the Bible predicts that the end times will see an unprecedented proliferation of false Christs and Antichrists. Jesus warned, Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will mislead many. If anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or behold, he is there, do not believe him, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show signs and wonders in order to lead astray, if possible, the very elect. Mark 13, verse 6, and also 21 and 22. Those satanic impostors will culminate in the final Antichrist, who will be more vile, evil, and powerful than all the rest, probably more than all the rest combined. So I wanted to lead off with that great observation, that great summary of what the whole term Antichrist means. It's kind of a... a a misnomer, a misnomer for this being here, this person who ends up being possessed by Satan. Um, because Antichrist, really the term means against Christ. Um, but it also, in, more so in this case, means false Christ or pseudo Christ. So he's going to be a false Messiah who comes along. Also, it's been, it's been said that the only books that say anything about the Antichrist or the false messiah are Daniel, Revelation, and also in 2 Thessalonians 2. However, the abomination of desolation is, is um, one such undisputed typology that few will dispute. Gabriel foretold it to Daniel. Jesus referred to it in the Gospels. So you have Matthew, Mark, and Luke that refers to it as being in our future. So clearly there are types of Christ that we see written by the prophets in the Old Testament all over the place. Especially in the context, you know, when you're reading Isaiah and some of those passages that refer to that day, those days, that time, those times, 
um, the great terrible day of the Lord, the day of his wrath, that generation, you know, all those different terms about this time in history that we're, we're um, coming to. So it's all language leading up to judgment and the kingdom. It's not limited to just those particular those particular chapters. Let's move on here. I want to want to focus on something too because what we did when we got to this weird place in, in the book of Revelation is we landed at a place where you have the first three and a half years and then we got to chapter 11, as you recall. That was the whole thing about the two witnesses. And then by the time we got to the two witnesses, we had this verse 15 and following in, in chapter 11. And it, it says uh, about the, the seventh trumpet, it says, then the seventh angel blew his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven. And so th that language goes on in the rest of that passage, but he never really gets to the bowls because this is what kicks off the bowl judgments. In fact, as you see on the right, when you get into chapter 15, he refers back again to those seven angels. It's the seven angels with the seven plagues, which are the last. For with them, the great wrath of God is finished. So we've got closing out chapter 11, or that whole period really in chapter 11, all in the middle of the tribulation, the start of the great tribulation. And it's where the abomination of desolation comes in. That's where we first see the beast of the, in the pit and so forth. And we see chapter 12, the war in heaven and the flight of Israel to get out of Dodge and go to potentially Petra, Jordan, and other places. So that's their flight. And then we've got all the way through chapter 15, where you've got all the preamble setting up the bowls and exposing more of the personalities at play, including... Um, how Satan interacts with the Antichrist and how the false prophet comes in and the things they do right right to kick off at the start. So that's what this chart here shows you is that we get a little bit of preamble to the plagues here in chapter 15, all this from heaven telling what's going on. And then chapter 16 is boom, you see, you see the, uh, the balls. There's a lot of preamble going on with chapter uh, 14, 15 with the sea. The staging of Armageddon. Armageddon, I think, is going to be a stage and setting, but it's going to continue on all the way to Christ's returns. So, however long that period is, and you know, if it's a couple, three years, it might be three years, there's the staging, and then there's not going to be the actual battle. So, all that's going to be probably some skirmishes back and forth. Don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but we'll get to that part when we get there, and we'll, we'll speculate a little bit, and we'll see if we can figure out exactly what's going on. But uh, it's interesting. Now, without further ado, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea, Revelation 13, of course, with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems, or crowns, on its, on its horns, and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. Okay, so let's unpack this a little bit. This is this is fun. Now, can we agree that the number of different views of the Antichrist are as varied as the colors of the rainbow? I mean, it's kind of ridiculous. So let's see if we can filter out a little bit some of the things that it's that aren't true and some of the things that are true. And you'll have to study on your own, probably go off on the side, and you'll have to come to some conclusions on your own. So, But the beast rising out of the sea is described differently than in chapter 11. Remember that was the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit? And so the one out of the pit and ascends is uh, in present tense. It's It's not in the past. It means that this is what he does. It's his practice. So it could be that the beast rising out of the bottomless pit is Satan who possesses the beast rising out of the sea. Now, out of the sea doesn't mean he's coming out of the Atlantic Ocean or the Mediterranean or whatever. In the biblically speaking, it's a Hebraism used frequently. It has to do with large numbers of people. So it's a sea of people. You find this frequently. You'll find it again here in the book of Revelation, but it's in the Old Testament quite a bit. So 
you know, two different beasts, but we, as we saw happen in um, chapters 11 and 12, there's a merger that happens, right? Just as what happened with Judas. The beast is described as coming out of the sea, so just sees a large countless number of people. So this particular beast is the false messiah, so he's been along for three and a half years. He's the man of sin we know as Antichrist, who spends the first 1,260 days rising to power on the earth. So he's positioning himself, he's politicking to lift himself up and to bolster himself. So now note his realm of authority is over kings and kingdoms on the earth. Yet verse 2 says that is the dragon. Who's, who's the dragon again? Satan. The dragon is Satan. And we had that in chapter 11 clearly, right? And we have that again in uh, chapter 20. But yeah, Satan is the one who gives him his power. His throne and his authority, clearly indicating that these are two distinct entities. So Satan's in him, in him and he's giving him his power and his um, authority to do things. What we're going to do is, at some point, we're going to look at the, the ten horns that represent ten kings. We see this also, this imagery in Revelation 17, 12. There's seven heads, which would be seven kingdoms. That's in Revelation 17 also. And um, so some of those... Those nations that came along in the past, when you talk about seven heads or seven kingdoms, if you follow that imagery that happened in, you have Samaria, which was with Nimrod and Babel. You had Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, um, Greece, and then Rome. So when we get into the leopard and the lion and the bear and, and all that good stuff, let's just look and see what that's about. See... The order of events in, in Daniel is Daniel sees a lion, the bear, and the leopard. And in Revelation 13, John is seeing the leopard, the bear, and the lion. So it says, and, and the beast that I saw, in, in verse 2, right? It says, the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth were like a lion's mouth. We talked about symbolic language before, figurative language. And remember, we discussed there's... Two different hints that we might get sometimes that we have figurative language. One would be the word as. His tongue was as a two-edged sword. And then there's like. So it's simile type of a thing. So these terms where he talks about these past kingdoms, a lot of times, and we'll get into that next week, people will make much and get into what kingdoms are involved at this time that point to the Antichrist and who he might be, and maybe he comes out of one of these animals that are represented in the nations. The leopard and the bear and the lion from Daniel chapter 7. The leopard historically was a metaphor for swift Alexander the Great of Greece. So he was swift. The bear, his, uh, he was the, represents the, fe the fierce streets of Palestine in those days, and that was among the the Medo-Persian Empire around Iraq. The lion was a metaphor for the Babylonian Empire. So the lion arrogantly speaks, which is the root of a false religion from the very beginning of history. Babylon was where we see all this false religion. Now that starts it. We now see emulated by other false religions and in certain churches. We'll get into the kingdom of nations next, but let's, let's look at this another way. Here's another way to look at it. Here's on the left, you see where Daniel, looking for it, says, uh, sees the lion for Babylon, the bear for Medo-Persia, and the leopard for Greece, and then he sees the beast with ten horns. And then looking backwards from his present situation where he's poised, in Re Revelation 13, John is looking at this beast with ten horns, the Antichrist, and he sees the leopard and the bear and the lion. So what John is seeing is that this one guy has qualities of all of these. So his kingdom will be swift, just like Alexander the Great's was. There will be, you know, the leopard and the beast with ten horns, the lion. All, all these things all represent this one guy, this one personality. The question is, why are they similar? <laughs> so he's possessed by the same great demonic princes, probably, right? Who are influencing these rulers in the past? Now, it could be that these same so called princes, these demonic rulers, might be in the Antichrist <coughs> leading up to this point before Satan goes in there. Well, Satan has his uh, patterns 
well. I mean, you had to burn your children, you know, to Moloch, and now we have abortion, and you have the Babylonians. Even in the Eden, you can be a god. Let's be like, you know, now we have the Gnostics, look, it's all about knowing, and you can know what God knows, and so it, Satan uses the same tactic. I mean, we fall for the same tactic, let's be real. Yeah. Very true. It's speaking of falling for the same thing, because remember, he's a pseudo Messiah. He's going to present himself like Christ, and he's going to be well loved and, and uh, well liked. A lot of people will find it hard to believe. But um, now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together, this is Second Thessalonians two. And our, our, concerning our gathering together with Him, we ask you, verse two, not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And then the man of sin, see Paul refers to him as the man of sin, he's revealed the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Then he continues, Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to, to the working of Satan. With all power, signs, and lying wonders, so he's going to have miracles, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth and had pleasure in unrighteousness. Um, another passage about this person in John 5, verse 41 to 43. Jesus said, I do not receive honor from men, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will, you will receive. Now, about this, this false Messiah that people will receive, this is kind of dark and it's kind of heavy. I'm going to kind of weighs me down. This is not my favorite topic. I talk about Satan and his Antichrist and everything. Um, I have in my hot little hands some things I'm going to read you. Because people will debate Antichrist, who he is, his nature, where he comes from, all these kinds of things. So I want to eliminate one thing. It's very popular right now to say that the Antichrist, when he comes along, is going to be a Muslim. And I think it's because, you know how you, um, sometimes you watch movies, and it could be a science fiction movie that's supposed to be 500 years in the future. But it's like the bad guys are always Nazis. Or they're always like communists, you know, they have a certain accent or something because they're taking what people are f familiar with in, you know, current culture and imposing that on the ultimate bad guys so that they sometimes the bad guys will have this German accent or a Slavic accent or something like that to, to you know, nod the head and to hint that, hey, these are bad guys, folks, listen to their accent or their Costumes or whatever their uniforms might be, you know, might hearken to those types of cultures or whatever. Well, I think since the common bad guy that everybody's about fed up with today and they can't even get along with each other and the Muslims in Islam and they don't get along together, whether it's Sunnis or Shia or even among themselves, they can't agree on anything. So then sometimes some popular fiction today will have. Uh, Antichrist is being like a, a European guy who, you know, blonde hair, blue eyes coming out of Europe, coming out of the UN or maybe Germany again or whatever. I lean toward, because of the language, 
just the term Messiah and how everything in this chapter, in this book rather, everything in this book is about Israel now that the false Messiah, because he's called a false Messiah, he's not called a phony president or a mean president or anything like that. He's called a Messiah that he's Jewish. But people will debate that. Some people that you know I respect greatly will will come on come down the side that he's probably going to be Muslim. So what I did is I, I sent some emails and I found some articles and stuff and I thought maybe the best way to approach this might be to to really look and see who the rabbis would accept. So I have this one email here, for instance, from I don't know if his name's pronounced Chana or if it's Chana, C H A N A. Benjaminson, anyway, he said, Hi, Mr. Reynolds, the Messiah must be Jewish according to Jewish law. And yes, he must descend from the Davidic line. And then he offered some links to verify that further. Um, here's an article. And who is the author of this? I assume probably another rabbi. He says, the Messianic redemption will be ushered in by a person, a human leader, a descendant of kings David and Solomon, who will reinstate the Davidic royal dynasty. According to tradition, Mashiach will be wiser than Solomon and a prophet around the level of Moses. Um, ever since the destruction of the Holy Temple in every generation, there is an individual, a Sean of the house of David, who has the potential to be the, the Mashiach. If at any moment the Jews are worthy of redemption, it's kind of an interesting way of looking at it, right? Not even correct biblically from the Old Testament. The person would be directed from above to ascend the role of Redeemer. Now remember, we are, we're looking at this from their perspective because we're not looking at some great doctrinal theology. We're looking at who are the Jews looking for? Who are they going to pick? Who are they going to accept as the Messiah? It's mentioned in, in the article that he'll be a monarch ruling over humanity with kindness and justice. He'll be the ultimate, the ultimate teacher, which means rabbi. Uh, how will we identify the, the Messiah? He, he's not identified by his ability to perform earth-shattering miracles, although he's going to do that. We read in Scripture, right? He's not going to be identified that way. The way they're going to identify him is, um, see, if we see a Jewish leader who toils in the study of Torah and is meticulous in his observation of mitzvah, influences the Jews to follow the ways of Torah, and wages the battle of God, this person could be the presumptive Messiah. If the person succeeded in all these endeavors and then rebuilds the Holy Temple in Jerusalem and facilitates the ingathering of the Jews to the land of Israel, then we are certain that he is the Messiah. Interesting, isn't that? Another one from... This is an introduction to, to the Messiah. And in here is a paragraph where he says, um, second paragraph, he says, the Messianic era will be ushered in by a Jewish leader generally referred to as the Mashiach, or Messiah, Hebrew for the anointed one, a righteous son of King David. He will rebuild the Holy Temple in Jerusalem and gather the Jewish people from all corners of the earth and return them to the promised land. This is what they're looking for. I'm not going to read the whole article, but... Um, let's see, the pre-Messianic era, let's see, this is from 2004, an excerpt from Rabbi Kaplan, his handbook of Jewish thought, somewhere down in here, he mentions the Messiah can come at any time, totally without warning, he refers to upheavals and technology, return to Israel, okay, there's a section in here where this rabbi says, one of the most important traditions regarding the Messianic era concerning the ingathering of the diaspora and the resettlement of the land of Israel. And we're seeing that more and more, right? The Jews coming into the land. And then it says there's a tradition that the ingathering of the exile and the rebuilding of Jerusalem will go hand in hand as the two most important preludes to the coming of Messiah. Jerusalem will come under Jewish control. Um, furthermore, according to the final words ever spoken by a prophet, Elijah will return as a prophet. So Micah was the one who spoke, who spoke, he was the final prophet who spoke about Elijah. Elijah will return as a prophet and announce the coming of the Messiah, as it is written, Malachi 3, 23. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of 
the great and awesome day of the Lord. This is necessary because the Messiah will be a king, and the king can be anointed only by a prophet. Do you think a Jewish prophet is going to anoint a Muslim? Um, he's going to... This has got to take place. First of all, this prophecy where he's anointed, it can take place only in the land of Israel and not in any other land. What else does he say? Um, one of the most important events in the Messianic era will be the rebuilding of the Holy Temple. So they keep hammering on that, don't they? So to speak. Um, let's see. Oh, they're even looking at Gog and Magog as a, a, an advent of great suffering before the advent of Messiah. Interesting. Uh, he says, there are prophecies that there will be a war of Gog and Magog around Jerusalem, according to this tradition. According to this tradition, that's actually the scripture. But anyway, when the nations hear of the success of the Jewish people in rebuilding their land, they will gather to do battle against them near Jerusalem, led by Gog, the king of Magog. The battle will symbolize the final war between good and evil in Jerusalem. All evil ultimately will be vanquished. This is, again, the, the modern Jewish perspective. Uh, he also says the Messiah of whom we have been speaking will be a direct descendant of King David from the tribe of Judah. He is therefore known as Mishiach ben David or Messiah, the son of David. And he goes on in this vein, um, looking for the final prophets. So that's Rabbi Arye Kaplan who wrote that article. Then we'll look at one more here real quick. something different. Uh, all about Messiah. And it starts off with, descendant of King David, he will usher in an era of world peace. You seeing a pattern here? So much not a blonde haired blue eyed European guy and not a Muslim. The final Messiah will be a normal human being born of human parents. It is thus possible that he is already born. This is from 2009. And he goes on to say, um, tradition states that he will be a direct descendant of King David, son of Jesse, as it's written. A shoot will come forth from the stock of Jesse, and a branch will grow from his roots. Isaiah 11.1. 1. Likewise, in our prayers, we ask, may the shoot of David flourish. That's in, that's in their regular prayers that they pray. And may the memory of Mashiach bin David rise up before you. There are, a number of, uh, there are numerous Jewish families today that can trace their ancestry directly back to King David. Interesting. The final Messiah will be the greatest leader and political genius the world has ever seen. He will likewise be the wisest man ever to have lived. He goes on to say the Messiah will also achieve prophecy and become the greatest prophet in history, second only to Moses. It's kind of saying the Messiah from the second to Moses. That's funny. Um... See, goals and mission, he goes on with a sixfold mission that they expect from the Messiah. Uh, cause the world to return to God and his teachings. He'll also restore the royal dynasty to the descendants of David, the building of the temple, Jewish people in the land. And everybody recognized the Messiah as the king of Israel and restore the sacrificial system in the temple. If there arises a ruler from the family of David, immersed in the Torah, and its commandments, like David, his ancestor, uh, following both the written and oral Torah, who leads Israel back to Torah, strengthening the observation of its laws, and fighting its battles, etc., etc. This is who they're looking for. See, they're looking also for many non-Jews that are going to feel compelled to convert to Judaism. God thus told his prophet, I will return to Zion, and I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. So Zechariah 3, Jerusalem will become the spiritual capital of the world. They say, in Jerusalem, the Jewish people will thus be established as the spiritual and moral teachers of all mankind. At that time, Jerusalem will become the spiritual capital of the world. Yeah, one last thing in here. He says, Afterward, the children of Israel will return and seek God, their Lord, and David, their king. They will come in awe to God and his goodness. Um, in the days, at the end of days, and that's from Hosea 3, 4, 5. Similarly, my servant David will be king over them. They will all have one shepherd, who will also follow my ordinances and observe my laws. And that's Ezekiel 37, 24. So I think that, for me, just strengthens the position that the Antichrist 
will have to be, he'll have to be a Jew. The false Messiah has to be a Jew, not a Muslim. So he's going to trick the Jewish people and yeah, and he's, also all the other people in the world well, too. Yeah, yeah. You see, they're looking. Hey, we're looking for the guy who's this great leader, and we're looking for the guy who's going to help bring the Jews back home and build the temple. That's the guy. Non-Jewish people will be liking him too. Oh, I'm sure they will, because so. what we know from scriptures is more that he's going to be doing besides just things for Israel. Oh, right, so, right. you know, he's going to be, you know, um, trying to broker world peace and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So. Are the Jews um, looking for the Messiah in the same way that we're waiting for um, the Lord to return? They're, um, they're looking for the Messiah in the same way that, that we're looking for the Antichrist, <laughs> you know, because we know now, because we've read the book, that they're going to be deceived in the things that they're going to look for, because Christ foretold some of that, right? They're not looking for the lowly man, even though it was prophesied in Isaiah, for instance, who's going to um, come riding on the back of a foal and, and all these types of things. They're ready for somebody to come riding on a white horse or whatever. But some of the things we just read from them are things that, are interesting, but it's not exactly second coming stuff. And this is the thing that the Jews have missed is that they're getting ready for this new kingdom, not realizing that you've got to be redeemed. You're not ready to live within the glory of God yet. And this is what the disciples also didn't see, right? Um, what happened to Moses when he wanted to see, telling God, show me your glory. And God's like, dude, you don't know what you're asking for, <laughs> you know? So he says, okay, go stand in that craft of the rock, stick your face in there and stand and don't look whatever you do. And I'll put my hand over you as I walk by, you know, to keep you from frying. <laughs> so <clears throat> this is what happened. Moses hid in the cleft of the rock. And this is a king of the priest. Let some of his glory come down. Let it shine and let it glow. Walk past Moses. And Moses was able to see the glow, even though his face was in the cleft of the rock. You could still see it. That explains, too, how you have no need of the sun. I'm not saying there is no sun, because there are places in the Bible that says the sun's eternal, but there will be, when the kingdom comes, there will be no need for the sun, because his glory is just going to shine everywhere. It's going to shine, his radiance is going to shine out of New Jerusalem, and it's going to cover the whole earth. How does that happen? Well, how was Moses able to see the glory when his face was drummed into the cleft of a rock? And he came out and he had to put a veil over his face for quite a while, because it was too much for people to view. So the disciples did not see that we are not ready to live eternally in that kind of presence of God because we're sinners, we're wicked, and we would just fry. We never glorified bodies first, right? Uh, and the um, Israel today suffers the same malady of not recognizing that they're not ready. And it, the Redeemer is also the Lamb of God. So they weren't looking for the Lamb of God. They weren't recognizing the Passover as referring to their Messiah. It's just another one of the chain of rituals that was given to Moses. So there's a, that's an interesting study in itself. It's a great question, and, and you could spend a lot of time on that. And um, I think you should do that. You should pursue that. Those differences, have a column down the middle and look at some of those differences. But it's, it's the same thing that the disciples were looking for in their day. And Jesus had to disappoint them and say, not yet. You're not ready yet. Well, first, the Son of Man must... That's the yeah, guy on the cross, right? I, I was curious if, if, uh, if that's something they actively talk about. Or if they, if they yeah, no, they just discuss it frequently. In fact, once in a while you can find um, videos on YouTube or so forth. And if, if you're looking in the right places under the right sources, and you can find interviews and things that are discussed also in English. A lot of times these rabbis will discuss things in English or somebody will be doing a voiceover because... It used to be up until, at least up until real recently, that half the world's Jewish population was not in Israel, but like in New York, you know, migrating between New York and Florida, depending on time of year, but living in the United States, which is the reason why I think God had Columbus discover the Americas was for that reason, as a refuge. Um, it's speculated with lots of good cause. Some people claim to have sussed it all out and discovered that Columbus himself was half Jew. So there were all these laws, bad things were happening in the 1400s in Europe, 
and the Jews were being sent to pogroms and so forth, ghettos, and basically locked down and sequestered in areas, and Columbus was able to get money, coincidentally, to, to in ultimately end up coming here to the Americas, and yeah. um, look what came out of America. A lot of bads coming out of America, sure, but it's been a refuge for believers for many times through history, and, and we're not a, a Christian nation. Um, might have been when the pilgrims came here and some of those people, you know, you could make that argument, but there were still the Native Americans here, the Indians or whatever they were called, they were here. Um, politically, even it never was a time, although the some of the documents, whether it's the Bill of Rights, Constitution, those kinds of things are based on principles that you can find uh, many of those same principles um, expressed in the scriptures. But if, if ever there was a time that we were a Christian nation, we are absolutely now post-Christian. Or, you know, it's just anti-Christian even, right? Watch TV, listen to radio, watch cable, read books, listen to the music, look at the politics, look at the politics that are coming down against, mm -hmm. against Christians and against things that are of value to us. And we're not even just post-Christian nation anymore. We're just kind of blatantly, flagrantly anti-Christian now. So not the worst in the world. You know, there are worse places in the world, and you can look at China and other communist nations. You can look at a lot of the Middle Eastern nations, you know, that will, if, if, if you found a convert, even if your family's Muslim, they'll go kill your family. They'll behead you, and they'll kill your family. Probably kill your family in front of you first, then behead you. Put a tire around your neck, set it on fire, or I guess that happens a lot in, in uh, Pakistan, India, places like that. So it's, um, they're worse places to be, so... I don't know about you, I'm thankful to be here and that so far we're still free to read the scripture. This is why we should be doing it daily. We're still free to worship and pray, even though people are hostile towards us. So, lots to be thankful for, right? But the Jews are still looking for a Messiah to come. They're still looking for Elijah to come first as the forerunner, like John the Baptist was for, for Jesus. Uh, during the Passover Seder, they'll set out an extra place setting for Elijah in case he shows up. <laughs> and that's... Thank you for reminding me of that. That's because uh, I strayed off from when I was originally talking about interviews. A couple of interviews Hillary and I have caught lately in news articles and things are of rabbis saying that, oh, yeah, we've got, we've already spoken to the Messiah. He's here. He's just waiting for the right time to step up and expose himself. And I don't know, you know, is, is, are the, these couple of rabbis wacky or did they really talk to the Antichrist? You know, and he's just, right now we know Second Thessalonians 2. He's not going to be revealed yet, right? But they claim, yeah, oh yeah, we've already spoken to this guy, and we're excited. You know, we're looking for the time we can get the temple and all this. So this is one of the things they're looking for for the Messiah to do, though, is to help them build their temple. So that's the kind of thing that that they are looking for in, in the Messiah is the kind of thing we're expecting from the Antichrist. So it's fascinating. So okay, as we have on this slide here. We'll move forward. And there's room for more questions. It's fine. I, I love what we did last week and we just departed a little bit here and there to answer questions. And we, anytime you have questions, we're, we're at a, a key point in history at the beginning of the Great Tribulation that was significant enough to, for Jesus to point it out, talk about the abomination of desolation and say, watch for it. Because when you see this happen, so it's significant, right? So the coming world leader has... 33 titles in the Old Testament and 13 in the New Testament. Um, the prince that shall come comes from Daniel 9, 26, and 27, in which the people of the prince that shall come would destroy the city and the sanctuary. The fulfillment occurred in history when the Roman legions under Titus destroyed Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD. But then there's another future fulfillment of that, right? Because he didn't fulfill all that. Um, Isaiah 10 says, Ah, Assyria, the rod of my anger, the staff in their hands is my fury. Against a godless nation I send him, and against the people of my wrath I command him to take spoil and seize plunder and to lead them down like the mire of the streets. When the Lord has finished all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, 
He will punish the speech of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the boastful look in his eyes. Now, king of Assyria, he's called the king of Assyria, he's called that wicked prince of Israel. We can look at some of those passages. I'll show you a map here pretty soon, and I want, what I want you to notice is the overlay. And it'll show you some of these ancient cities, and if there's ever any doubt as far as Satan's desire to conquer, conquest, and enslave Israel, however these kingdoms, the territories, move, merge at the center of all these territories, was always Israel, right smack dab in the middle of it. So there, there's a lot of overlap on these territories. We'll look at that in a second. But here's some of the names that uh, are attributed to the Antichrist. Uh, the branch of the terrible ones. If you want these references, these Bible references, let me know and I can give you a list. Uh, the chief prince is also called the crooked serpent, the cruel one, destroyer of Gentiles, the enemy, which is the same title Satan has too, right? Evil man, uh, head over many countries, head over northern army, Worthless Shepherd, we're going to be looking at that one um, at this time too. King of Princes, King of Babylon, Little Horn, Man of the Earth, Merchant with Balances of Deceit, um, The Mighty Man, The Nail, Prince That Shall Come, Prince of Tyre, Profane and Wicked Prince of Israel, Proud Man, Rod of God's Anger, Seed of the Serpent, Son of the Morning, Spoiler, destroyer, um, vile person, violent man, wicked one, willful king. So in the New Testament, he's also called, because we're talking about the, the version that's possessed at some point, right? The angel of the bottomless pit, the antichrist or pseudo-christ, the beast, the lawless one, the man of sin, one who comes in his own name, the son of perdition, and the vine of the earth. From Ezekiel 21, <clears throat> verses 25 to 27. And you, O profane wicked one, prince of Israel, whose day has come, the time of your final punishment, thus says the Lord God, remove the turban and take off the crown. Things shall not remain as they are. Exalt that which is low and bring low that which is exalted. A ruin, ruin, ruin I will make of it. This also shall not be until he comes, the one to whom judgment belongs, and I will give it to him. Now, what's interesting is this passage does refer to the last king of Israel, and he was a wicked king. So historically, this did happen. But talk about near and future fulfillment, just as similar as what we were looking at before with the abomination of desolation. Was there a time when Jesus came down from heaven and had his crown taken away and... Um, it given to the Messiah, the next king is to come. No, he's been the last king of Israel. So the Antichrist comes, and ultimately this false Messiah is going to be a false king of Israel. And this is exactly what's going to happen when Jesus comes. See, the one to whom judgment belongs, and I will give it to him. Okay, this also shall not be until he comes. So the Messiah, the real king, the root of Jesse and David, he's going to come and the crown to rule is going to belong to him. So this is one of those near and far fulfillment things. That's how we know wicked prince, profane, wicked one, prince of Israel applies to Antichrist because that in part there did not happen. There was nobody, no king came and took that crown of judgment or ruling or anything else from that final king. So the mock Christ will be received by Israel. The Jews will be deceived by him. Now, as, John, as Jesus prophesied in John 5.43, when he says, Him you will receive, they'll believe that he is indeed their long-expected Messiah. They will accept him as such. If this pseudo-Christ succeeds in palming himself off to the Jews as their true Messiah, then he's got to be a Jew. He would have to be a Jew for that to happen. It's unthinkable that he'd be received as a Gentile. Now, there are some, for instance, like even um, Arnold Fruchtenbaum. Arnold Fruchtenbaum, who's a Messianic Jew, is a Christian Jew, believes that the Antichrist could be a Gentile. You know, you make your own decision. That's, you know, it's not a 
salvation type of an issue, but I think for the reasons that we've been looking at here so far, I don't really think that's so. And if, if for nothing else, for one of the main reasons is that's not who the rabbis are looking for. The, the leaders, the religious leaders in Israel are looking for. And they're looking for a prophet to come, and the prophet, what well, you have to be a Jewish prophet, is going to have to certify him. This is an interesting, we'll go slow on this part, but this is another thing I think that demonstrates his Jewishness, and I really like this, by A.W. Pink. Speaking of John 5, 43. And speaking of the false Messiah, the Lord Jesus referred to him as follows. Another will come in his own name. In the Greek, there are four different words translated another. In our, um, in our English versions, one of them is employed but once, and the second one is about five times. So these need not detain us now. The remaining two are used frequently, and we've seen them here in Revelation, right? Remember we are talking about an angel, I saw another angel, and each time it's been alos, another of the same kind of angel. If, remember we talked about the one angel who's standing with one foot on the sea and one foot on the sand, and he raised his hand. If Paul said, I, I saw another angel and it was a heteros angel, then you might be able to say, oh, well, now that might be Messiah because that messenger or whatever that he's seen might be Messiah because it's heteros would be a, another of a different kind. But alos means the same kind. So here, applying that same rule here as we've discussed before, alos signifies of the same kind or genus. And he gives examples, Matthew 10, 23, that we're not going to go into here, but you can jot them down and you can look at them. 13, 24, 26, 20, or 26, 71. And you can also look at a, a Strong's or in your Bible software and you can trace those out. Now the second heteros, as we discussed, means another of a totally different kind. And he gives examples for that too. Mark 16, 12, Luke 14, 31, Acts 17, 18, Romans 7, 23. Okay, now here's where he gets interesting, and I like his point. Now, the striking thing is that the word used by our Lord in John 5, 43 is alos, another of the same genus, not heteros, another of a different order. Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David, presented himself to Israel, and they rejected him. But another of the same Abrahamic stock should come to him, and then they would, re they would receive so he maintains, Pink maintains, that that's what Jesus was saying. Uh, another from the stock of Abraham is going to come, and him you, you're going to receive. So he maintains the fact that he used Alos shows that he will be a Jew. Questions? Did I lose anybody on that one? It's Greek to me. We also see that he will come from the old Roman Empire and also will be known as the Assyrian. The Assyrian was part of the Roman Empire and he will be at least part Jew. So how do we know that he's going to be part of the old Roman Empire? This is what we're going to get into next week because we've got this vision of this figure, this statue that um, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed of and Daniel had to interpret the dream and you had the two legs of iron and the feet of miry clay and iron. So we're going to, we're going to get into that, but we also see Babylon in there. So we're going to look at these because it's kind of confusing because you see what you see Roman and you see the Assyrian, but it's going to come from Israel and you also see Babylonian stuff in there. So we're going to see if we can figure out what some of that is about. Beyond that, when do we find out? Just to reiterate, and we've been through this passage before, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. Now, here's the thing. There's, this is much disputed even who... Um, who it's talking about when it's talking about he who now restrains. Some people will say he who now restrains is the church. The church is the restrainer. We're salt and light on the earth. So we are the he who now restrains. Others will say he who now restrains is God. With respect to the restrainer being the church, it's interesting because we've had the restrainer since 
Job and in the rest of the Old Testament, haven't we? It hasn't the restrainer. Hasn't wickedness, hasn't Satan been restrained and had to do things by permission since the Old Testament? That's before the church. I point that out, and I think that's that's interesting. Because if if Satan had to go to God in Job chapter 1 and in Job chapter 2 and get permission to torment and test Job, Satan's restrained. Clearly, we saw instances of Satan restrained in the Old Testament many times. And um, God going before the Jews even, in so many ways, preventing some things from happening that if Satan was given free reign, his demons were given free reign, they, Israel would have been destroyed long ago. So it's, it's for these reasons I believe the restrainer is, is God. Um, we have triune God dwelling in us as believers, right? We are the temple of God, so we have God in us. Um, Second Thessalonians 2, it says, um, He who now restrains it will do so until he's out of the way. Now some people will say, until he's out of the way, we'll make it sound like until he is taken out of the way. Well, it doesn't really say that. He's going to restrain until he's out of the way. It doesn't mean somebody's moved him out of the way. If he's taken out of the way, it can be the same way as Jesus by virtue of, you know, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and also God resurrected. So you had the whole Trinity involved in the resurrection. I don't think that means that he who restrains it will do so until he's taken out of the way, it just until he's out of the way. He moves out of the way. It could be voluntarily. I don't know if the Greeks is anything different from that, not anything that I've ever seen. And since when is the church, the bride of Christ, referred to as a he? I can't think of other passages that do that, can you? I can't think of a place where church is he. You can if you say, well, the church is the body of Christ and Christ is a he. You can do that. That's about as close as I think as you're going to get. So at some point, God, notice it's a he, not a they, or a she, um, as in the bride of Christ, is out of the way. Or um, he figuratively steps out of the way, giving the man of all this permission that he may be revealed in his time. Verse 6, that he may be revealed in his time. There's a very specific timing for this. Meaning this tribulation week is the son of perdition's time and Satan's time by permission from God. So yeah, certainly the church has got to be out of the way because the Holy Spirit's not going to get out of the way without moving us out of the way too. We're dwelt by him. The restrainer though um, through all times always been God, even before Job's day, the church restrains the salt and light, too. And the temple of the living God, but only by that extension that we're sealed permanently and dwelt by God. And thus we see God is not going to step out of the way and quit restraining without also taking his church out of the way. Remember we read in, in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 9 and 10, Paul had just written to the same church and told them what in the previous letter? Verse 9. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation or deliverance through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we were awake or asleep, meaning dead, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. So looking at Revelation 13. Again, verses 5 to 7. I'm trying to bring all these together and make sense and, and, and point it all to the nature of who's restraining, what the nature of the Antichrist is, what his limitations are, and so forth. So verses 5 to 7 says, And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty, blasphemy, blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months, three and a half years, right? It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming the name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. And it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. Notice that. It's not just the ten nations, and it's not just Assyria, and it's not just Babylon, and it's not just Israel. He's given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. Daniel 7 says, similarly, in verse 21 and 22, it says, And I looked, 
the swarm made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. So Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5 tells us his church, the bride of Christ, are not appointed to wrath. We know from Revelation 6, which kicks off the tribulation week, that there is wrath there in that chapter. The chapter says so. Revelation 3.10 tells us that this trouble, this tribulation, will be upon the whole earth. And Jesus said the same thing in the Olivet Discourse, and that there's no time that's so bad before or since. Revelation 3.10 also tells us, tells us that there's an escape from the whole earth trouble. So how does that happen? How, how do you escape from this whole earth trouble if it's the whole earth over every nation, tongue, people, and, and so forth? But nevertheless, Revelation 3.10 does tell, tell us that, which means we escape from off, off the earth. So we also know that the beast is allowed to exercise authority and make war with the saints on the earth at that period and to conquer and prevail over them. So God will remove the church during the day of his wrath, the day of the Lord, this time of his wrath. We see that Satan will prevail over the saints during that time of God's wrath. So, all right, so what does God's word say about Satan's authority prevailing over the saints and so forth in the age that we're in now? He, Jesus, said to them, and who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered them, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now the, the word for prevail comes out better in Greek. The English kind of mucks it up a little bit. Um, the word is katiskuo. It means to overpower. It's, it's a verb, so it's a proactive kind of a thing. It's not a passive kind of a thing. So it's overpowering due to strength and um, to prevail against or to overpower, get the upper hand. So it means to be strong to another's detriment, to prevail against, to be superior in strength or to overpower. And Jesus is saying this will not happen to his church. So it's, and when it comes to saints, though, when we read about saints, and people get confused sometimes when they read about prevailing over the saints at this time. The saints, what does that mean? Well, it's important to understand that, like the word elect, believers of all eras are saints or the elect. It doesn't matter whether you're Old Testament, um, New Testament, doesn't matter if it's before Moses or after Moses or during this tribulation week. You are saints and you are the elect. Um, and it certainly will be there certainly will be saints during the millennium, right, and for all eternity. So we're only told concerning these saints that have identified as the church, the body of Christ, um, and the bride of Christ also. But then we have that in Revelation where they do successfully, they're by permission, prevail. So there are attempts now because the gates of hell now hell the location is identified with the person. It's, otherwise, it's just the location. It's like heaven. When you talk about, you know, um, don't swear by heaven above, or you're, you're saying something by heaven above, you're talking about God because that's where he dwells. Or New Jerusalem in Revelation 21, um, the angel points to it, the angel with the bowl, points to it and tells John, behold, the bride, now wife. And he's pointing at New Jerusalem. Why? Because New Jerusalem is identified with us. It's our eternal home. So, um, and, and uh, Kenneth Woost addresses some of this in some detail too, as do others. Satan, and by extension demons, they're going to be bound in some fashion during the Millennium Kingdom. So this won't be an issue there, even once he's loose at the very end to try. Um, during the Old Testament, Satan had to be do everything by permission. Job 1 and 2. So he has no permission to go and, and to take us out. Let's take one last look at Revelation. Let's start with verse 3. It says, um, One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound. This will be the last part, and we'll wrap this up. One of the heads seemed to have a mortal wound, and its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast, and they worshipped the dragon. For he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, 
who is like the beast, who can find it. So this passage here, when it's talking about heads, it's often argued, too, that it's talking about um, a nation, though. So they're saying that this mortal head wound is that one of these nations is receives the wound and um, then is healed. And then the whole earth marvels as they follow the beast. But the passage refers to a global system that has been established and Antichrist is positioned among the leaders, which are the heads with the crowns in a kingdom. So the debates whether the head that suffers a mortal wound is Antichrist or a kingdom. So what we see in Revelation 17 is this. If you, if, if you look at Revelation 17, you can flip there if you want, starting in verse 9, it says, Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come. When he comes, he must continue a short time. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. Confused yet? That's We're going to get into that next week. That's a preview into next week. We're not going to chapter 17 next week. We're not skipping the other chapters, I mean, but we're, we'll look at these nations and kind of unravel this wording here. So it's maintained that because the one is, was during John's time, who then? And why during John's time and not during the Great Tribulation? That's my question. It's maintained at times that this is the Roman Empire, wounded and fallen during John's time, that became and uh, revived. It's an upcoming and revived Roman Empire that matches the feet of the statue in Daniel with the ten toes and also the, the ten horns. The thing of it is, though, is the language is it's very specific. Look at Revelation 13.3. And one of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled and followed the beast. But read this in Zechariah 11.17. Woe to my worthless shepherd, or idol shepherd, I-D-O-L, not um, not idle as in idling like a car sitting in the driveway idling, uh, an idle shepherd or a worthless shepherd who deserts the flock. May the sword strike his arm and his right eye. Let his arm be wholly withered. Let his right eye utterly blinded. Now, does this speak of a person in history? This idle, worthless shepherd, did this happen to somebody? I haven't been able to find who this is if this actually happened to an actual physical person. So as being in Zechariah, the language looks like it's, it's future, and it's very specific. So if this refers to a kingdom, it's confounding because, okay, what we know the head refers to a kingdom, but what's his right arm? His right eye. Well, some, some people will say, well, his arm has to do with strength, and his right eye, you know, his right arm strength, and his right eye has to do with his, his wisdom or his knowledge. Okay, so if, if he's killed or if he's destroyed or he's made to, is it only half his strength and half his eye, or he's half blind? It doesn't, if it's a nation, how does a nation become half? It's, it's very specific. How is an arm of a nation wholly withered and a right eye utterly blinded, but the left is okay? So that it, some things that don't quite make sense. So Revelation 13 doesn't say the moral wound is received by the Antichrist. So then we conclude that um, from this passage here where it says this, it says we can... You know, what we can do is we can acknowledge that it could be the Antichrist. It could be also referring in some way to a nation that's damaged as a result to. Maybe it's referring to the old Roman Empire. I don't have a problem myself with seeing it as both. Um, because God does this kind of thing sometimes. Ties um, like the woman, Mystery Babylon, or in Thyatira. You know, the woman in Thyatira in, in uh, Revelation chapters 2 and 3 where we talk about the churches. And talks about the woman Jezebel. And he says, well, I've got a bed for her. And it's not a literal bed, right? So he uses this type of language sometime. And I think he might be doing the same kind of thing here. So Zechariah passage seems very specific with the blindness and the withering of the arm and all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of, so you let me know what you think, but I have a trouble seeing that kind of language fit a nation. But nevertheless, there's that passage, and the passage in Zechariah is, too, about this very end time. So the fallen Roman Empire, wounded and raised Antichrist, as often happens in the scriptures, I don't, I don't have a problem with both being true. I don't know why they have to be exclusive. 
It's a whole nation. The head was cut off and it's not a nation anymore. So how do they go and worship the dragon? So it comes back and then they all worship the dragon. Everybody in the nation worships the dragon. See, there's kind of a some things I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with there as far as that goes and making that just a nation and not literally Antichrist. The woman in Revelation 13, 17, by the way, the woman's not Israel. And, um, it's about the global universal false Christ worshiping Babylonian like religion, Mystery Babylon, a false religious system that focuses on the man of sin, the man of perdition, but also ends up worshiping the dragon run by the Antichrist. So uh, by the time the world sees the Great Tribulation, the seven headed dragon, according to most, like the animal examples, are what we see Daniel. And Daniel um, presents past kingdoms, the Roman Empire, and so forth, making a comeback, and lots of behavior at the Antichrist beast, behaving with the same power, strength, swiftness as these old kings. So we, we'll look at that next week, those kingdoms, because that's all kind of confusing. But I know this Antichrist stuff is, is kind of a mess, and you can, if it's confusing, you can then kind of see probably how so many people have been debating who he is and where he comes from and how that works. What are your thoughts so far on this? Well, I thought you made it look easy when you read all those letters from the Jewish people. <laughs> that, that, well, that's what I was hoping to accomplish, because I, I think that's, we can't, we can't ignore that, right? There are these biblical passages, and people will debate what the biblical passages says. So we'll kind of run to a third authority, which is, okay, well, assuming the Antichrist comes in this time, because we're raptured, we see the tribulation this time. Who are you going to be the ones making the decision or looking and deciding who the Messiah is? Well, that would be you know, the religious leaders in Israel. What do they say? What are they looking for? So I thought that that would be a good way to, to nail that down. But they're looking at him as a different person than we're looking at him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Anything else? Any questions? Lots of questions. Any headaches? This is not um, I said this isn't a, a, a favorite topic as far as that goes, getting into the stuff in the darkness that happens in demon-possessed and Satan-possessed people and so forth, emulating Christ and stuff. The only gold lining I can pull out of all this is knowing that this is the time Christ spoke of. And, 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 like in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, Jesus kept saying, you know, he's talking about these things, and then the end shall come, and then the end shall come, and then the end shall come. So it's, it's promising us, look at it, it'll be over. And then shall come the coming of the Son of Man, the sign of the coming of the Son of Man in the clouds and so forth. So we have hope. And so our eyes are on the hope. These are signs we're not going to see this. And really, you could even argue a lot of this, a lot of people won't have made up their minds as far as the Antichrist until maybe the time when he is possessed and he starts his scorched earth policy and starts burning earth to the ground. So a lot of people will wait until they get up into the second half of the tribulation before they even start deciding that, hey, this guy's, I don't think this is a good guy. Like when I say that, at the same time, we see we saw at the end of chapter 9 that all these horrible things happened to the earth and demonic creatures were loosed on the earth and people continued to, with their sinful ways and so forth, their drug abuse and sex abuse and everything else. And then they also worship the dragon. So that's kind of incomprehensible so so the um seven heads um you said are kings or kingdoms mm -hmm. is that modern kingdoms uh, well yeah it's modern kingdoms but see what what the habit is and it's it's really smart of god to do this when you have the authors write the names you have them write the names that people would be familiar with so that you'd know the territorial areas um like on the wings of an eagle, you know, you got from um, Exodus all the way up through into the future. So the same idioms, the same names, you can kind of trace throughout Scripture and tie them all all together after after a fashion. Now the question comes: How much? And the debate rages: How much of that is is figurative, and how much of that is actual? And uh, I think we're hopefully demonstrating more and more as we go on that that this stuff is actually real deal stuff and, and uh, not all of it's figurative where there is figurative like a dragon he tells us like he did in, Reve in Revelation chapter 17 now the horns are this and the heads are this and the, so he tells us what the what the meaning of the terms are so, anything else yeah so when it says he has um he has seven heads 
Does that mean that those kingdoms are like behind him, like supporting him? Apparently so, and, and they're supporting him, and he's, at least what ends up happening is he ends up overall ruling over them, because remember we saw what he, and it, it, we'll talk about this next week, but it's interesting, it, it talks about these uh, seven kingdoms and seven seven hills or seven mountains, and how do we interpret that? And a lot of people will say, well, Rome is known as the city of seven hills, therefore, hey, this stuff's going to come out of Rome, and it's going to be Rome. Well, it, it might be, but I have one trick question for you. If you remember, if you go back to your geography from school, okay, how many continents are there? Seven continents. And they poke up out of the oceans, out of the water, out of the sea, right? So possibly we know this stuff happens over the whole earth. Seven continents, seven hills, seven mountains, the whole earth. Just my notion, which is based on nothing other than, I think it's kind of interesting. Something Babylon. worth considering. Babylon is also built on seven hills. It is. You know, if you do that, then you can check. I think it's Wikipedia or one of those City of Seven Hills or whatever. And all kinds of cities come up that are named that. So people were trying to apply eagle and what that means and some of these biblical prophecy things, eagle, in a very Howlingian-ish kind of a way, find out whose national bird is the eagle. It's got to be about the United States. Well, no, it's not just about the United States. You'd be amazed. How many countries all through history and now have the eagle as their national bird? So, can't really do it that way. Okay, so we'll close in prayer and then we'll come back next week, hopefully, and um, or hopefully not because of the rapture, but you know, if we're here, we'll come back and we'll look at some of these things with the seven hills and the nations and all that kind of stuff and the. Nebuchadnezzar's statue and the three animals, you know, the bear and the leopard and the lion, oh my. And uh, so we can figure out the, as far as the significance of these. Thanks for your patience.